Hey, what's up guys? My name is Sal and this is another Expedition Log. Over the course of this episode, we'll be revisiting the Friendship Heights Washington DC Wisconsin Avenue slash Chevy Chase Maryland shopping district and three of its main pillars of retail. As always, I hope all of you are thriving and living your best lives. We're starting to see the beginning of our return to normalcy and I've already planned out two big expeditions. So get excited and make sure to follow me on social media and to join the Dead Malls of Discord server for updates. Links to everything are down below. It's also worth mentioning that less than 10% of my total views come from people actually subscribed to me. So if you dig my content, I'd appreciate it if you subscribed and rang the bell for all future notifications. But today, I'd like you all to come take a walk with me on one hell of an excursion. First, we're revisiting Maza Gallery to briefly discuss some big developments for the property that just came to light and to see some unreleased footage that didn't make it into Xlog 87. Then we'll quickly walk through the shops at Wisconsin Place before making our way back through the Maza Gallery, down through the Metro, where we'll find our ingress to the focus of this episode, the Chevy Chase Pavilion. But first, a word from our sponsor. The culinary expertise of Stephen Reed, some old Austrian yodeling men, and a time when Chevy Chase used to be relevant. Enjoy. And today we're making a rice dish that is really easy to make. And this one here, you just dump the rice into the thing, pull the packet out, and then take two teaspoons of butter and we'll put it in the microwave for one minute. Open. And that's done cooking. We'll pull it out of the microwave and we'll stir it up to get the butter to coat all of the rice. And when that's all done. Another two minutes this time. We'll pull it out and you. And then we'll just stir it up a bit and We'll set it for 20 minutes, make it 20 minutes. You have this hot dish that you can eat that's made with rice. And I'm Stephen Reed, and this was Weaver Cooks. shooting a Super Bowl commercial. It won't take long, Chip. You're canceled. Canceled? Yeah. Sorry. How do you get canceled out of a commercial? You're not getting the ratings, Chevy. Ratings? Demographics? It's all wrong. Just four or five other commercials the audience likes a lot better. They do? Oh, you're out, Chip. Uh, I like this stuff. Well, keep the bag, Chip. Oh, you're a sport. Yeah, no. Terrific guy. You're good. You look great. <laughs> In Xlog 87, we got to know the Maza Gallery intimately, along with its history. After I premiered the film though, I realized that there was about 5 minutes of footage that I totally neglected. Then while a few people and I were discussing Maza in the Dead Malls of Discord server, an article surfaced about the future of this property. So I figured that instead of making an entire video devoted just to this one bit of news, that I'd tie in the new footage as we made our way over to the Chevy Chase Pavilion. I digress. 
The Maza Gallery, as told in my previous episode, has been around for quite some time. Back in the mid-70s, Olga Maza had inherited land from her late mother, Louise, and she was looking for a financing partner to open a new mall in the Friendship Heights neighborhood of Washington, D.C. The Exxon Real Estate Development arm decided to finance the project, and the senior anchor brought in for the mall was Neiman Marcus, who was a Texas-based chain catering to the whimsical and expensive tastes of clientele that made their fortunes in the Texas big oil industry. So Exxon getting involved with this project that included Neiman Marcus shouldn't come as a shock. How do you get into this mall? Oh, it's right there. Right. Okay, oh yeah, we're getting landmark mall vibes. Oh yeah, I'm getting mad landmark mall vibes in here. The mall opened on November 7th, 1977, showcasing a gigantic marble Neiman Marcus with no windows, but carrying an attitude that only the elite should shop there, and they're expected to, because this is high fashion after all, and those with money must spend it on all of the expensive things. The mall wasn't doing too well after opening, much to the owner's shock. As if opening a mall around a chain that would quite literally sell you a live camel from a catalog sounded like a good idea in a part of the country where politicians frequented tight-lipped black tie events. The people of this area don't want to buy a live camel just to brag at a party full of Stetson hats and big belt buckles. It was seen as a huge mistake for the demographic, despite opening in one of the richest areas of the country, and the mall didn't age well. By 1997, the soulless mall with no windows was sold to Daniel McCaffrey in June of 1997 for $28 million. He immediately pumped $30 million into the property, with big glass windows installed to bring some much-needed light and life into the concourse. After McCaffrey's renovation, the mall was sold again in 2004 to the Teachers Insurance and Annuity Association for $62 million. By 2011, Filene's basement had left, and would sit vacant until 2013 when a TJ Maxx began operations in the space. This addition of a lower-end retail outlet, such as TJ Maxx directly underneath a white-gloved department store like Neiman Marcus, brought some much-needed traffic to the mall. And with this success, the mall was sold again in 2017 to Ben Ashkenazi for 78 million bucks. 2020 came around, and Mr. Ashkenazi defaulted on the property. By August, New York-based Annaly Capital won the mall at a foreclosure auction for 38 million dollars. Later in the year, Neiman Marcus and the AMC Theater closed, leaving the mall with one sole tenant, TJ Maxx. And that's where we left things off, in Xlog 87. But then, just two days prior to the narrative being written for this episode, on May 26th, 2021, it was announced that Maza Gallery was sold. A community bank in Washington, D.C. named Eagle Bank issued a $26 million loan to New York City developer Tishman Speyer. The new owner released immediate plans that emphasize less retail space is more. Tishman Speyer plans to redevelop the property from the ground up. The loan issued by Eagle Bank will be used to construct 350 apartments while retaining about 26,000 square feet of ground floor retail at the new apartment complex. Given the fact that the shops at Wisconsin Place is a solid shopping destination with healthy sales, and the Chevy Chase Pavilion is firmly planted as a hotel, while all of the haute couture offerings like Tiffany & Co. are just up the street, turning Maza Gallery into apartments is a fantastic choice. I actually see this suggestion in my comment section a lot, where people want to see a dead mall turned into apartments. And while I'm sure many want to see the existing structure converted to apartments to retain the look of that dead mall, my hunch here is that we'll see most of the building demolished and a new apartment building erected on the site. But I will keep my eye on this place and provide updates on social media. Before we head over to the Chevy Chase Pavilion, and since this is probably the last video I'll be producing on this area, at least for a while, I thought it would be appropriate to dedicate just a couple of minutes to the shops at Wisconsin Place, especially to illustrate just how close these three properties are to each other. So let's head over there really quick. The shops at Wisconsin Place play such a big part in the Friendship Heights community. The first iteration of this space was as a Woodward and Lothrop, which opened in 1950, predating the other big department stores by about 14 years. The Woody's chain went bankrupt and was converted to a Hecht's in 1995 following its acquisition by the May Company. 
Just over 10 years later, when Federated Department Stores was in the process of converting their Hecht's into Macy's, they chose to turn this Chevy Chase Maryland location into a Bloomingdale's, bringing a huge redevelopment to the site, which opened on September 27, 2007, as you see it right now. The complex would gain a Whole Foods grocery store in 2010, a 20,000 square foot community center, and a mix of restaurants and high-end retail stores, such as the Capitol Grill, P.F. Chang's, Anthropology, and BCBG by Max Azria. Despite locals' complaints against bringing Bloomingdale's to the area, this shopping complex is incredibly successful with its diverse offerings, and this is how you do an outdoor shopping complex the right way. Okay, so just to provide the utmost clarity here, right now I'm at the shops at Wisconsin Place. That is the Mazda Gallery. Directly across the street from it, right here, that's the Chevy Chase Pavilion. This place that I'm in right now is like an open air mall. So, you know, it's, a, it's doing just fine because it's adapted to what this community wants. If you put two malls directly next to each other, like you did with Mazda Gallery and the Chevy Chase Pavilion, you're going to have a bad time as you've seen in the last two videos. The shops at Wisconsin Place offer a wonderfully eclectic mixture of shopping and dining. Bringing a grocery store and restaurants to the site breaks down the barrier between haute couture and the common shopper, unlike Mazda Gallery across the street, which catered only to the ultra elite with its white glove service at Neiman Marcus and Saks on Fifth Men's Store. I think that during the pandemic though, and during the quarantine, folks just decided that they didn't need the luxury offered in a place like Mazda Gallery, which ultimately led to its downfall and demise. But so far, we've seen two of the main general retail outlets here at the intersection of Western and Wisconsin Avenue. But the third entity making up this retail thruple is the Chevy Chase Pavilion. So let's head back over to Mazda Gallery so I can show you just how close these three retail establishments are. And we'll go back through the metro entrance at Mazda Gallery because that's just the coolest way to do it. I just couldn't help myself. I had to step foot inside the Mazda Gallery one more time, since we won't see this place on the X-Log probably for quite some time, if at all, ever again. But I promise you all a walk through the Chevy Chase Pavilion, and I am about to deliver. But I need to warn you first. You're going to see a big Christmas tree and some festive decorations. I filmed this whole area in January, and I was going to sit on the Chevy Chase Pavilion footage for a Christmas episode at some point. But I've made the decision to prioritize production on anything that I've shot amidst the COVID pandemic because it's coming up to the time when we all need to press on and get back to business. So that's why you'll see some Christmas and Hanukkah stuff in an episode that I produced just a couple of weeks before summer officially begins in 2021. But I think you'll all agree with me though, that it's time to formally put the past behind us. And now that we're on the back half of X-Log phase four, we'll close this phase of my series out with the remaining footage that I've shot during the COVID era. But getting back to the episode at hand, I'd like to highlight just how close the Mazda Gallery is to the Chevy Chase Pavilion. They share an entrance from within the metro and either direction will take you to a dead mall. You take the red pill, you go to a dead mall. You take the blue pill, you go to a dead mall. It's unbelievable how they've coexisted for such a long time. And as I've been producing content around the DC Baltimore area, the amount of dead malls and struggling retail is just whack. By this point in the episode, if any of you are still with me, I can't really say something like, with no further ado, because we've had way too much ado so far in this episode, and I appreciate all of you giving me the chance to guide you through about 15 minutes of things before we actually get to the titular material for this film. For those of you on the Dead Malls of Discord server, you'll be getting a shiny new role for your efforts in watching this episode. If you haven't joined DMOD yet, you should. A link is in the description. At long last, I'd like to welcome you all to the Chevy Chase Pavilion. This once fancy enclosed mall operates primarily as an embassy suites hotel with three floors of retail in a big circular atrium. And while the hotel is considered to be the anchor for this mall, we'll be taking a brief walk through World Market in its last four days of operation, which many also consider to be an anchor space at this mall. And for those of you that are local, the first thing you'll notice is that the fancy colored LED lighting that's installed in the stairwells and the walls and everything, that's off. And this mall is just overall very dark. And the main source of lighting comes from the big Christmas tree right in the middle of the atrium. But let's get on with it and get into the Chevy Chase Pavilion. In the late 1980s, 
a new mall was announced to be opening in the Friendship Heights neighborhood, which would accompany Maza Gallery, but with a focus on office space. The mall, which was designed before 1987, was under construction by June 17, 1989, and scheduled to cost over $100 million. The aesthetic concept for the mixed-use building was more a part of the design language used throughout the adjoining and affluent Chevy Chase suburb, which was noted for its posh retail offerings, such as Gucci, Tiffany & Co., and Neiman Marcus, right across the street at Mazda Gallery, along with Saks Fifth Avenue. Bill Walsh, president of the John F. Donahoe & Sons development company behind this project, said that the strategy behind their new structure was to break free from the ultra-luxe atmosphere in Friendship Heights and to offer a first-class office space at the gateway to downtown Washington, D.C., with prices far below what one would pay closer to the center of D.C. Donahoe Development Company hired Clark Tribble Harris as the architectural firm for the new mall, who was the same firm that designed the Georgetown Park Mall. By the way, in all of my time filming for this series, I've never seen a sign from the Food Safety and Hygiene Inspection Services Division of any sort of government up in a Starbucks. It looks like this location decided to ditch their inspection. They might have been closed before, or they might be closed because of this. But either way, it's not a good look for Starbucks. Anyway. Georgetown Park was such a cool looking place back in the day. It had giant plants hanging from the atrium, walls and columns with a color I can only describe as a darker hue of cadmium green oil paint, and fitments that were a darker green wrought iron and golden accents throughout. There was a tile floor with half salmon, half turquoise, and plants scattered about with a multi-platter fountain in the middle. But unfortunately, it was redeveloped a few years back and now exists as an open-air district of shopping and services. It's still a great place to go visit, and I might head over there this summer to take a look, so stay tuned. But the reason I bring up Georgetown Park, aside from the fact that the same developer built the mall we're in right now, is that the description of the Chevy Chase Pavilion from 1990 before it opened sounds nothing like the way it looks today, and its interior design may have been influenced by Georgetown Park. In a March 4th, 1990 New York Times article written by Kirsten Downey, she goes on to describe the Chevy Chase Pavilion. Quote, the complex will feature, along with office space and an Embassy Suites hotel, about 125,000 square feet of retail space, the equivalent of 70 shops, centered on a sunlit atrium, its gurgling fountain flanked by artificial palm trees and statues of frolicking maidens. Close quote. By October 9th, 1990, the final price for the mall had come in and grown to $130 million and it was only one week out from its grand opening, there was already growing drama with its list of retailers. Donahoe had announced that a Barneys of New York would be coming to the mall in May of 1990, which was a huge deal. Barneys began as a discount chain, but they had rapidly expanded their profile to that of an upscale retail chain, which new developers were all vying for the business of. Bringing Barney's to Chevy Chase would have been Washington, D.C.'s first location and would also bring immediate credibility to the new mall. As a matter of fact, an 8,000 square foot Barney's was written into the floor plans released to news outlets for the Chevy Chase Pavilion. But Barney's wanted at least 20,000 square feet, so they never signed a lease here. But rather, they were eyeing a new location in Tyson's Corner. Security if you 
find him. Thank you. The Chevy Chase Pavilion had its grand opening on October 17, 1990, with its main tenant from floors 3 through 7, which was an Embassy Suites hotel. That's exactly where we're at right now, and as you can see, there's a lot of office space that occupies this area as well. At the time, the Embassy Suites chain of hotels was owned and operated by the Promis Companies, which was previously part of the Holiday Inn Corporation. The remainder of the stores within the mall were opened fully by early 1991, and the selections allowed mortals to shop in the halls of retail, while pointing the outer realm rich folk across the street to the bougie Maz Gallery if they were so inclined. Just shy of Chevy Chase Pavilion's first anniversary, there was an incident that would both confirm my suspicions about the similar design to Georgetown Park, and at the same time would hasten developers to enact changes to the codes used for mall design. In July of 1991, 17-month-old Zachary Golden was tottering around on the third floor of the mall while holding his mother's hand. He noticed a clown on stilts entertaining some kids down on the first floor courtyard, and he darted towards the rails to get a closer look. As his mom and grandmother looked on in shock, the boy slipped through the vertical guardrail down onto a ledge that was about 10 inches wide. Luckily, they were able to pull him up to safety, and he was unharmed. He probably had no clue what was going on. The guardrail bars at the pavilion were six inches apart, which met national and local codes for malls designed before 1987, but they were obviously far apart enough for a small kid to get through. While the new national standard established in 1990 had codes demanding rails be four inches apart, the mall was designed before 1987, so therefore it wasn't in violation. However, in an August 1991 Washington Post article, writer Lynn K. Varner confirms my suspicions about the mall's design language. She writes, quote, Chevy Chase Pavilion officials rushed to respond to Zachary's near accident, posting warning signs on all three levels of the mall and reassigning security guards to watch for small children heading for the mint green rails that ring the upper levels of the atrium, close quote. So this place totally looked similar to Georgetown Park in its first iteration, and Zachary's near accident in that article confirms it. If any of you have seen this place back before its renovations, let me know down in the comments what you thought. By 1994, the Friendship Heights retail neighborhood was being eyed by investors, and rumors of both the Chevy Chase Pavilion and Maza Gallery being sold were abound. Seabag Investments Incorporated, an arm of Siemens AG, the German electronics firm, bought the Chevy Chase Pavilion for $97 million in December of 1994. At the same time, Maza Gallery was in due diligence with a prospective buyer, Los Angeles-based investment management company Low Enterprises, Inc., who signed a letter of intent to purchase the mall. That deal fell through, and Low abandoned efforts to purchase Maza. But just four years later, on behalf of an unidentified pension fund, Low Enterprises purchased the Chevy Chase Pavilion from Seabag Investments in 1998 for $120 million. Keep in mind, that around this time, Daniel McCaffrey had purchased the Maza Gallery for just over 28 million bucks, a deal that Lowe decided was economically unviable. Even though he had signed a letter of intent to buy Maza, he didn't like the investment idea. Mark Dubik, who was a senior vice president for Lowe Enterprises, said that the food court at Chevy Chase Pavilion was half empty, and 25% of the 125,000 square feet of retail space at the pavilion was taken up by the Limited, to which Mr. Dubik responded, quote, in my view, that's a problem, because the Limited doesn't act as a traffic generator. They live off others' traffic, close quote. So Lowe Enterprises knew that they needed to put some money into this mall to bring it back to life. The pavilion stepped proudly into the new millennium, despite a lower than expected tenancy. But the vacancies caused the owners to rethink the property, and they would put the work in to try repositioning it in the market. 
By December 17, 2001, Lowe Enterprises was well into a multi-million dollar renovation at the Chevy Chase Pavilion. The new changes included updated signage, new lighting in the center and the parking garage, and new cosmetic improvements such as banners. New tenants signed during the renovations included J. Crew and Taylor Loft and a Washington sports club. The work was completed by March 2002 and the mall was doing pretty well after its reopening. A few years after the 2002 renovations, ING Clarion purchased the Chevy Chase Pavilion from Lowe Enterprises in 2005 for $217 million. Into the 2010s, the Embassy Suites Hotel would see an update to their rooms in 2009, and by 2011, ING had divested their interest in Clarion, and the new entity owning the Chevy Chase Pavilion was Clarion Partners. Then in 2012, Clarion announced a sweeping $32 million renovation project for the entire property. This project would completely reform the atrium and add widespread LED lighting throughout with accent colors up and down the staircase and walls. A brand new 14,000 square foot restaurant named Range was added and run by chef Brian Voltaggio, who was runner up in Top Chef season six. Accompanying the restaurant was the new Civil Cigar Lounge founded by the proprietors of W. Curtis Draper, the oldest full service tobacconist in DC and the third oldest in the United States. To cap it all off was a brand new three-level, 21,700 square foot H&M. This incredible renovation was completed and the Chevy Chase Pavilion celebrated its grand reopening on February 21st, 2013. As that renovation was completed, another renovation was started when Clarion began a $10.5 million renovation to the Embassy Suites Hotel, which was finished by August 25th, 2014. These redevelopments seriously strengthened the stance of the pavilion, repositioning the mall as a strong contender in the DC Metro retail landscape. By January of 2018, Clarion had decided to sell off its interest in the Embassy Suites Hotel and found a buyer in Philadelphia-based Arden Group. Arden secured $44.9 million in financing to purchase the hotel and immediately announced plans to pump back in $2 million in renovations. It was around this time that Brian Voltaggio's range closed in 2018. In December, Clarion had announced plans to convert nearly 100,000 square feet of vacant space into medical offices, while still retaining a small retail footprint, which faced harsh public opposition. By March of 2019, the H&M closed, bringing the mall to just under 50% occupancy, and the renovation plans had stagnated. But whether or not the owners were the cause for the large vacancy at the mall or not, it would come as no consequence with what lurked right around the corner of 2019. Emerging from the depths of an eternal slumber awoke a monster so hideous not even Medusa could gaze upon. The creature carried a stench akin to rotting fish and Limburger cheese at the bottom of a rusted out dumpster in the middle of a hot New York City summer. It had face tattoos, and under each eye were two numbers in ink. 20 and 20. No, this wasn't the monster's rated vision. It was the name of the beast. 2020 retched and heaved, and dragging its fingers through whatever just spewed out of its mouth was an even smaller and uglier creature that was more disgusting and even more hideous than 2020 itself. 2020 looked upon its creation and called it COVID-19. And the newly birthed demon ran off faster than the speed of sound, wiping its sickening, sticky moistness all over everything, causing everyone to run and hide, lest they be moistened by its grotesqueries. While the Chevy Chase Pavilion was struggling long before 2020 came around, COVID was the final nail in the coffin. Yeah, that's more like it. Nice. Come on. Let's go. Ah. Uh, only 15 minutes. You only have 15 minutes before it times you out. I think you have to pay for a lost ticket, which is like 30 bucks. This is ridiculous, and I have no idea where my car is right now. I heard it beep once. Oh, I think it's over there somewhere. Where, though? Oh, I see it. You 
sneaky bastard. I see you. Weird. It's gotta be over here somewhere. Oh shit, it's right there. As of January 2021, only a handful of stores were left, and I've seen no news on what Clarion plans to do in an effort to revitalize this mall, if any. As a matter of fact, there's countless articles written recently calling out this entire area for how much of a ghost town it's become in its retail space. News outlets have been eyeing the Chevy Chase Pavilion for its awful level of vacancy, especially now with the world market gone. They were focusing on Mazda Gallery 2 until the news dropped about its new acquisition and redevelopment plans. If any of you are close to this area, please let me know if there are any developments at the property or if any new tenants are being signed. I'd love to know because things are looking extremely grim for the once posh Friendship Heights Retail District. I'd like to thank all of you so much for watching this entire film. I would especially like to thank my patrons and elite explorers who support me directly. Now that we're looking at the return to some semblance of normalcy, your support will send me out on tons of new expeditions, especially now that I'm double vaxxed and ready to head back out. So thank you all once again. For those of you that are still with me, pushing 40 minutes into this episode, that means the world to me. I consider your engagement, the likes, the comments, the shares, the mentions on social media, I consider this a huge compliment and I'm a big fan of that stuff and it pushes me to make more content. If you're still with me and you haven't subscribed yet, you may as well just do it. At this point, you should just subscribe. I'm sure you're into my content, so let's just close the deal. You'll wanna ring the bell and enable all notifications because that's the only way that you can convince the overlords at YouTube to alert you of my new work. For those of you that already subscribed, do me a favor and just take a moment to check that you've also rung the bell and enabled all notifications, just to be sure. While the majority of this Wisconsin Avenue shopping district is high-end posh retailers, and despite the loss of many tenants throughout the entire neighborhood, I really do think that this place and many others out there will rebound now that we're seeing higher vax numbers across the country. I'll be heading out on many more expeditions moving forward, so please make sure you're following me on Instagram and Twitter. You can find me there by my handle at Salvatore Amadeo. If Facebook is your sort of thing, you can find me there at Quite Studios. For a better way to get a hold of me, and to chat with myself and the rest of the DMOD family, make sure to download the Discord app, get your account set up, join the Dead Malls of Discord, and just check in with a mod and answer a couple of questions. Links to everything are in the description for every one of my films. I'll be back in a couple of weeks with Xlog89, in which we'll visit Ellsworth Place in Silver Spring to round out our DC Metro tour before heading a bit further up north. But until then, stay safe out there, everybody. Take care of yourselves and have a fantastic day. And that will make it come out great. And now that it's cooked for 20 minutes, you have this hot dish that you can eat that's made with rice. You have this hot dish that you can eat that's made with rice and costs about a dollar. And I'm Stephen Reed, and this was Weber Cooks. <laughs>